I come back to you, how do you, how does the reasonableness standard apply when you're interpreting legislation? Would the, uh, if there was a decision of this court, would that factor into the reasonableness uh, standard? Well, th this court, I would submit, is, is to, uh, is going to interpret and, and apply that reasonableness standard in terms of actually Determ the determination of, of reasonableness by an adjudicator, um, what we're submitting this adjudicator should have done is, uh, or did do it rather, sorry, is he followed the overwhelming consensus. And that is the benchmark that, for example, has been identified in the Irving Pulp and Paper case as a signal of, uh, of reasonableness. If you have 1,000 or several thousand decisions saying, saying one thing, that is an arbitral pre precedent that allows uh, the court to conclude that this particular adjudicator, if in line with those, uh, with that consensus, is reasonable. And Can I ask you one question before you finish? One of the things that uh, Justice Stratus referred to was if it is reasonableness, uh, he talked about narrowing the discretion. Is, is this? Uh, what, what's your view uh, on the spectrum right. of discretion and, or reasonable in this? Succinctly, this? There, reasonableness is only one standard. Simple as that. Once it is reasonableness, you do not I inject some kind of an, you know, additional analysis to determine its intensity. Or as uh, Justice Bastarash said at one point, uh, former Justice Bastarash, one cannot be um, somewhat unreasonable more than one can be, can be somewhat pregnant. I see I'm out of time. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ball. Chief Justice, Your Honors. Employers were well aware in 1978 as to how the unjust dismissal provisions would operate, hence forcefully opposed the current legislation almost 40 years ago. They lost a battle in the parliamentary process. Notwithstanding Chief Justice Dixon's 1989 decision in Slate Communications, where it was noted that the values behind the unjust dismissal provisions we're dealing with today have the status of an international, international human right and represent Parliament's attempt to inter alia, protect the right to work, and to protect employees as a particularly vulnerable group in our society, we are here today. As Professor Simmons notes in our, in our factum, Parliament intended the unjust dismissal concept to be dramatically different from the common law wrongful dismissal concept, something very akin to the arbitrary concept of just cause something designed to ensure continuity of employment and to prevent arbitrary action on behalf of employers. As described in the court, Federal Court of Appeals decision of CIBC and Barbare in our factum, uh, uh, by Justice, a decision by Justice Marceau. As the late Professor England, a well-known authority in employment law, noted in the Arn decision found at tab uh, 12 our, of our brief of authorities at paragraph 13, he noted in this decision, being fired for being a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan as opposed to an Argonaut, trial Argonaut fan is not just. I think most people in Toronto would even agree with that proposition. Contrary to the court below, our position is the common law of wrongful dismissal, including the employer's implied contractual right to dismiss without cause by providing reasonable notice does not operate in an unjust dismissal proceeding because of Section 168 of the Code and the general scheme of the Code as demonstrated in our factum. It is established law that the employer has the onus to prove the dismissal is just. With all due respect, the respondent in his factum is trying to create a radical new onus scheme in the Code. Like in labor law, as demonstrated in this court's 2004 Lethbridge Community College, College decision, 
The presumptive remedy under the code is reinstatement with back pay, save in exceptional circumstances. This is noted by the very federal court of appeal very recently in the Payne and Bank of Montreal decision at page, cited at page eight of our factum. The code clearly contemplates make whole remedies. The fact that the unjust dismissal provisions were placed into a code suggests that the common law wrongful dismissal, including the employer's implied contractual right to dismiss without notice and without cause, are displaced by the unjust dismissal provisions during an adjudication. At page four of our factum, we discuss section 168 of the code. With respect, the court below ignores the first part of 168 concentrating on the second part. Section 168 mandates the unjust dismissal provisions to apply, quote, notwithstanding any other law, custom, contract, or arrangement. In other words, the unjust dismissal provision apply notwithstanding any contract of employment. The employer's right to dismiss on a without cause basis provide, providing reasonable notice is in a term implied in the contract of, of employment. Probably a term implied by law as the Chief Justice noted in the McTinger decision in 1992. Because, in concurrent reasons, because of section 168, this implied contractual term does not operate in an unjust dismissal proceeding. At page five of our factum, in the National Bank decision, your former colleague, Justice Rothstein, is quoted. He stated, quote, under section 168, the judiciary carries out his or her duties irrespective of whether an agreement exists between an employee and employer. The adjudicator only decides whether an employee was justly dismissed, and if so, the appropriate remedy. Consequently, the common law contract of employment and the contractual action for wrongful dismissal is not germane to an unjust dismissal proceeding. The only issue is, was the dismissal just? Our organization is very concerned about uh, that the court below has endorsed the adjudication award in, in Klein and Canadian Mint. In Klein, a written contract limiting remedies and an offer made at the time of termination of employment allowed the dismissal to be deemed just. This avoids the wisdom of Justice Rothstein and National Bank, the case I just cited, ignores uh, Justice Marceau's comments in CIBC and Barbera that freedom of contract cannot trump the unjust dismissal provisions of the code. Employers, in attempting to make their termination offers relevant to unjust dismissal cases or doing so to inter alia, avoid the presumptive remedy of reinstatement that I have spoken of. Looking at what the employer offered at the time of dismissal conflates irrelevant considerations into the test of what is just. The adjudicator's task is to determine if the dismissal is just, and if so, what is the appropriate remedy? The Court of Appeal, with respect, ignores a catalog of policy considerations regarding inequality of bargaining power between employers and employees, as discussed, for example, this court's decision in Mactinger. Ignored are concerns about employee vulnerability and protecting, and protecting the right to work, as, as expressed by Chief Justice Dixon and Slate Communication and Davidson. Inequality of bargaining power and vulnerability, for example, may be especially acute in many unjust dismissal cases where, for example, First Nations, First Nations employees are employed in isolated parts of Canada, such as, for example, the Alberta Northwest Territory frontier or the Arctic region of Quebec. A large number of unjust dismissal cases do indeed, in fact, originate from First Nations people, indeed, at the appellate level even. The statutory minimum notice and severance provisions, section 230 and 235, do not neuter or gut the unjust dismissal provisions of the code, as a respondent would ha like to have us believe. As the Canadian uh, Labour Congress points out as fact, and exi existed prior to the unjust dismissal provisions. A paragraph 13 of our factum, we refer to the decision of uh, Justice Nadon, uh, the Wolf Lake decision. 
at page six. And Justice Nadal describes the interaction between the statutory notice and severance provisions with the unjust dismissal provisions. Only if there is a quote unquote statutory exemption that the employee is limited to the 230 and 235 statutory minimums. The employee is entitled to full protection from unjust dismissal unless the employee is a manager, the employee, um, there's a lack of work or discontinuance of function, the minister decides not to appoint an adjudicator, the employee's worked less than 12 months. So unless there's a statutory exemption, the employee is entitled to the full protection of the unjust dismissal provisions. If there's a statutory exemption, the employee is left with 230, 235, and the common law, or the Quebec Civil Code. In 1978, Parliament gave employees a new substantive right, the right to challenge or appeal their actual dismissal. Not a few extrajudicial remedies over and above the common law as a court, of a court below would try to trivialize the Canada Labour Code on just dismissal provisions. The respondent is de facto trying to severely curtail and limit these rights. I submit this court should not allow this to happen. We know in our material that dismissal is often called, and it's one of the principles in arbitral jurisprudence and under the code as well, for unjust dismissal, the capital punishment of employment law is only justified in the most severe of cases. The legislation, with all due respect, with respect, needs to be interpreted with this in mind. Thank you, Your Honours. Maybe I'll take my friend's 27 seconds that he has left. This is unusual for me. Uh, I have a filed a condensed uh, book of authorities. Let me deal first, uh, Your Honours, with standard of review. Uh, the Federal Court of Appeal, Justice Stratus, ruled on the basis of uh, decisions of a very small minority of adjudicators. We've heard how many. Uh, that correctness review was required and appropriate in this case. In our submission, uh, this approach to correctness not only runs against uh, the Domtar approach, but this court's post dunsmer decisions. And so at tab one of the condensed book, you'll see an excerpt uh, of your decision in Smith and Alliance Pipeline, where following Dunsmer, the court again, this court again, confirms that conflicting decisions in and of themselves are not sufficient to displace reasonableness review. Um, if the uh, Federal Court of Appeals approach were accepted, this carries the serious risk of returning us to the 1960s and 1970s, the anisimic uh, approach to, to judicial review, displacing reasonableness by correctness as the dominant standard of review, undermining the expertise and independence of adjudicators, expert adjudicators. Um, the Federal Court of Appeal found persistent discord, sufficient inconsistency in this limited number of decisions as against the thousands of decisions that have gone the other way. Uh, that happens all the time in labor law. And so effectively, if that becomes the grounds for this court uh, moving to correctness standard, uh, judicial review will be fundamentally transformed. Picking up on Justice Abella's point, far from being inconsistent with the rule of law, respect for a strong privative protections has, has also been noted, including those specifically applicable in Section 243 to these adjudicators, is consistent with parliamentary intent, with the rule of law, for finality, expedition, respect for administrative expertise. Uh, one last point on standard of review. The Federal Court of Appeal attempted to anchor its decision in this notion that uh, this is a question of central importance to the legal system, which lies outside the adjudicator's expertise, somehow because of inconsistency. And, and we simply say, uh, first of all, the respondent itself in paragraph nine of its factum recognizes that that isn't the case. And secondly, just on the Chief Justice's questions, it's not so much how many people are effective. Every labor and employment decision this court makes by definition affects employees across the country. The question is what type of issue? Is it, does it transcend labor and employment law? Is it of central importance to the legal system? So for those reasons, we say the standard review is properly reasonableness. And in terms of 
Justice Cromwell's observation that, well, maybe then this court won't be deciding anything. In fact, if this court upholds as reasonable the adjudicator's decision, then there may well continue to be the odd outlier, but for the most part, virtually all adjudicators have interpreted the code in accordance with the appellant's approach. So you'd simply be restoring uh, the status quo ante. Um, the, uh, turning to the contextual factors that we say uh, ought to govern this court's approach to determining whether the adjudicator's decision was reasonable, uh, we deal in paragraphs 19 to 21 of our factum with the uh, Ritzo Abrahams benefit conferring nature of this legislation. Now, the Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the applicability of that approach uh, in paragraphs 85 and 86 of its reasons as begging the question because it thought that these provisions were crystal clear. Now, we say uh, that given the overwhelming interpretation by adjudicators, by the Federal Court of Appeal itself, the consensus view of Canada's most prominent labour and employment law scholars, including Professor Arthurs and Professor Simmons, and the legislative history, that at the very least, the interpretation of most adjudicators is uh, open and plausible and reasonable. It can't be that they're all wrong. It's certainly open. And so on that ground alone, um, it's appropriate also, therefore, to apply the benefit conferring principle that the uh, interpretation more favorable to the employee, to the extent there's any ambiguity, is the one that this court ought to adopt, at least in determining that whether the adjudicator's decision uh, was reasonable. And at tab five of our uh, condensed book, I've included uh, Justice Wagner's uh, reasons in the most recent recognition by this court of the appropriate approach to take uh, in interpreting minimum employment standards legislation in the Asphalt Desjardins case. Uh, which is completely consistent. Now, the Federal Court of Appeal took a different approach in another way. It relied on the uh, presumption expressed most clearly in paragraph 65 of its reasons that the legislature is presumed not to depart from the common law. But when it comes to benefit conferring employment standards legislation, this presumption simply can't apply. The very purpose of this kind of legislation uh, is to mitigate, redress, and overcome the power imbalance between employer and employee, which is rooted itself in the common law. So uh, we say uh, the Federal Court of Appeal got it wrong. Briefly, uh, there's uh, written submissions on legislative history, particularly in the appellant's factum. Um, I just want to, uh, at the very back of uh, my condensed book, there's a loose insert. And uh, I, I include that because in in paragraph 71 of, uh, of uh, the Federal Court of Appeals reasons, the, the Federal Court of Appeals says, well, uh, there was evidence before the parliamentary committee considering the unfair dismissal provisions uh, that it was aware of the Nova Scotia legislation, but according to the Federal Court of Appeal, deliberately chose not to use the language of just cause, instead using unjust dismissal. Now, uh, Justice uh, uh, Stratus refers to the excerpt I've included from the Parliamentary Committee, and in fact, when you actually look at what the Parliamentary uh, Committee uh, was, uh, the evidence there, the Deputy Minister pointed out that uh, in their consultations with other provinces in developing these new provisions, they looked to Nova Scotia and how their system of protecting persons against unjust dismissal operated. In other words, uh, Certainly, uh, the Deputy Minister understood that Nova Scotia protected unfair dismissal through the use of just cause in the same way as the Canada Labour Code was proposed to be amended. Uh, in paragraphs 12 to 17 of our factum, we deal with another significant contextual factor, uh, which is the inclusion of a power uh, to uh, reinstate. I won't say more on that, um, except to uh, note that this court, through its case law that we review in paragraphs 12 to 17, has recognized reinstatement as the key remedial mechanism through which just cause protection has displaced the common law right to dismiss on reasonable notice. Uh, and I've included at tab 8 of our condensed book Professor Dury's discussion of that point. Uh, 
I just want to respond uh, as well to the separate submissions uh, in the Intervenor Federally Regulated Employers and Canadian Association of Council of Employers Factum that based on uh, Isidore, the, this court's decision in Isidore, Isidore Garon, the right to notice of termination and severance pay under the code necessarily implies that the unfair dismissal provisions do not prevent an employee from terminated an employer uh, from terminating an employee without cause as long as reasonable notice is provided. Um, and the intervener also argues in paragraph 25 of its factum that this court's recent 2014 decision in Walmart stands for the proposition that section 124 of the Quebec ALS um, the Act Respecting Labour Standards, the equivalent to the Canada Labour Code Part 3, does not prohibit without cause terminations. Now, um, first of all, the... That statement is not in line with our prior case law. Yes, so you have a prior case in 2010, uh, which I've included... Uh, you're ahead of me, Your Honour. Which, which I've included at tab uh, 4, uh, in which both Justice LaBelle for the majority and Justice Deschamps, who was dissenting in that case, recognized that the Quebec protection in Section 24 of the ALS against dismissal without good and sufficient cause is equivalent to collective agreement just cause protection. So we have in Quebec good and sufficient cause as the standard, we have in Nova Scotia just cause as the standard, and we have federally for 40, almost 40 years um, unjust uh, dismissal as the standard. And uh, so my friend is just simply wrong to suggest that Quebec legislation uh, stands for the proposition that he, ad that, that he advances. And uh, Justice Deschamps actually uh, explicitly in her decision in paragraph 73 describes the Quebec legislative protection as extending to non-unionized employees the same protection as unionized employees have under just cause uh, provisions. So just in conclusion, and contrary to both the intervener's submissions and uh, my friend the respondent's submissions, um, not only does Quebec protect with different language and Nova Scotia with different language the same sort of protection as is afforded under the Canada Labour Code, but no special words. This court has recognized that no special words are required uh, to provide that protection, whether it's good and sufficient cause in Quebec, as I said, just cause in Nova Scotia, unjust dismissal under the code, the intent and effect is to provide equivalent or similar protection as unionized employees have under collective agreements. It's the same in all three jurisdictions. The legislature has modified deliberately the common law by providing protection against dismissal without cause, by providing for a power to reinstate, which is, turns the common law upside down, and uh, overcoming the common law or civil law right, depending on whether we're in Quebec, to dismiss without cause by providing reasonable notice. Thank, Thank you. you. First, we'll take its morning recess. Mr. Snyder. Chief Justice, members of the court, good morning. <clears throat> the outline of my submissions will be as follows. First, I will address what is the appropriate standard of review. Second, I will, this being a statutory interpretation case, I will review with you in a sequential fashion the relevant sections of the code that substantiate the right to dismiss without cause. My analysis will demonstrate essentially two things. First, that the term unjust, as used in Section 240, means unjustness that can arise in both dismissals for just cause 
and dismissals without cause. Second, my analysis will demonstrate that the statutory right to dismiss without cause is compatible with a legislative regime that requires employers on demand to require reasons for the dismissal and that which equips adjudicators with the right to reinstate. Third, I will respond to certain ancillary topics raised by the other parties, including the reliance on the benefits conferring principle, the uh, former minister's remarks in introducing the legislation, and the burden of proof. So I'd like to turn now to the first issue, standard of review. The respondent agrees with the appellant that the appropriate standard is reasonableness. Having regard to the substantive issue that you have to decide here today, that being whether an employee can be dismissed on a without cause basis, is an issue that is not of central importance to the legal system. It doesn't raise a constitutional question. It's not jurisdictional in nature. It's specific to the Canada Labor Code and it certainly was within the specialized expertise of the adjudicator to decide. I think that this court's relatively recent decision in McLean is dispositive of this issue. And I have enclosed an extract of that at tab one of our condensed book. And I ask you to draw your attention specifically to paragraph 38, which I've highlighted for your convenience. And here, Mr. Justice Moldiver wrote on behalf of the majority, of which Madam Justice Karakasanis, uh, in her separate judgment, had concurred that where the ordinary tools of statutory interpretation lead to a single reasonable interpretation and the administrative decision maker adopts a different interpretation, its interpretation will necessarily be unreasonable. No degree of deference can justify its acceptance. Thus, in our case, you have two interpretations that cannot stand together. Either you can or you cannot dismiss without cause. One must be reasonable, the other not. Now, although Justice Stratus did apply the correctness test, it's important to note that in any event, he concluded that even on the reasonable standard, the outcome of the decision would have been the same. So in summary, the reasonable standard applies. If there are not any questions, I would like to move on to the second and substantive question. Imagine, if you will, members of the court, for a moment, that you are a part three code employer. You hire a legal secretary and an administrative clerk. You find 14 months into the relationship the work product of the secretary is not as stellar as it once was or perhaps you thought it would be. Unfortunately, there is not a basis to dismiss for just cause. Fifteen months into the relationship, you find that there's a bit of a personality change in the administrative clerk. Again, not a basis to dismiss for just cause, but again, <clears throat> the relationship is not as comfortable as it once was. The rapport is not the same. So in other words, you view these employees no longer to be a good fit for you and the organization. You're just not optimizing the operation of your business because of them. Now, according to the appellant's position, you are saddled with these employees until they decide to leave. That is, that they are to be treated as though they were unitized employees enjoying permanent job security. With respect, that assertion is incorrect and is not supported by the code. This is what I was, I'm confused about because it seems to me that one could look at this legislation and say, if you don't have any cause at all, if it's just completely arbitrary, that's forbidden. On the other hand, there could be a cause that falls short of what I would call a just cause that might allow the employee, that would allow the employee to say, you know what, uh, I shouldn't have been, I, 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 my, my dismissal was unjust in the circumstances. What you've just given us, where you said it doesn't reach the level of just cause, which would allow you to terminate without notice or severance, is there an in-between? 
between just cause, a cause, and no cause? No. No. I was going to address that very subject matter when I got to the reasons for dismissal because it all works into the issue of the discussion about arbitrariness and capriciousness. But before I get there, because as I said, I want to address this sequentially because that's section 241. I think it's important for this court to understand the, the underlying foundation of the right to dismiss without cause. And then I can address your question in more detail, although I'm in your hands, uh, Mr. Justice, to answer it now if you wish. Looking at your paragraph 36 which is essentially the way I think you've led off here. And of your fact. Three lines into it, you say, in the case of a dismissal without cause, I'm presuming you're talking about without just cause because you go on to say the reason could be that the employee was not viewed as a good fit. Well, isn't that a cause? Yeah. It's a cause, I'll just finish it off, it's a cause. It may not be a cause that allows you to dismiss without notice or severance, but it's still a cause. And, and, and as opposed to the situation where you have no cause whatsoever, it's just completely arbitrary, and this act would say you can't do that for someone that's there more than 12 months. You just can't dismiss on a completely arbitrary basis. But there could be a situation where it doesn't amount to just cause at common law in the sense of I no severance, no, no, you get what I'm saying? I, I, I do indeed. I think that, and again, this comes back to the reasons section. And let me just address this now because it has been raised that that section isn't compatible with the regime to terminate on a without cause basis, which I want to get back to. We submit that that isn't the case at all. If you have regard to the section 241 in which it states that reasons must be provided, it states, doesn't say that just cause reasons must be provided, it says reasons. And so the reasons can be for reasons other than the existence of just cause. So the reasons could be that the individual was not a good fit. Now, there are essentially two scenarios where the reasons provide. I just have to interrupt you. Could you say there's no reason? In the letter back, could you say we have no reason? Pie in the sky, probably, but, but let's just assume that. It is because, you know, and this comes to the issue of arbitrariness and capriciousness, but let me just finish, if I may, my comment about the reasons. The reasons provided will become very significant in two essentially scenarios. The first is where an employee is dismissed for just cause. The second is where the employee is dismissed without cause and provided a severance, but that employee views it to be a pretext to have de denied his right to protection or benefits under legislation. And in that kind of case, the employer is going to have to substantiate the dismissal based on those, those reasons provided. But can I ask you this? Do you have to give a reason? I look at the letter in this case, and it said that the complainant was terminated on a non-cause basis and was provided a generous dismissal package. Are you saying that's a reason? No. So you are you saying that no reason is required? If you have regard to the material and are addressing this in the factum, you will note that this letter was written in the context of the time it was requested. Again, there was nothing in the complaint to suggest that there was an allegation of retaliation. Notwithstanding, all of the predecessor counsel that represented the appellant before uh, my friend Mr. Lanuri were solely concentrating on the adequacy of the severance. So when that letter was then requested, that's what resulted in what's before you today. In hindsight, I was just going to say, in hindsight, I, reason should have been included in that letter because Section 241 does state that where reasons are requested, they must be provided. So you're saying then it would comply with the section if the letter had said, we find that we are mutually uh, incompatible or, uh, or we no longer have a good fit. Correct. Or, so some reason has to be given. And I'm, I'm wondering, 
why that's the case if you say, it, under your interpretation, that in fact you can terminate anyone's employment provided you've given them two weeks, you've given them notice and severance. Why would you need to give a reason? Again, I've already outlined for or delineated two uh, scenarios essentially where those reasons provided are going to be significant. Where just cause and where there's a pretext. Otherwise, the reasons provided are irrelevant because Section 241 must be read in conjunction with Sections 230 and 235 that permit a dismissal on a without cause basis. I, I guess I'm just having trouble. Perhaps you can help me with this. I'm not sure what purpose would be served if, in fact, an employer can always terminate with cause and uh, severance without any particular reason. I'm not sure what purpose would be served by requiring a reason. I don't think any employer is going to admit that they were discriminatory or that they were arbitrary or if, if it was, if you say it was a pretext, I don't think any employer is going to, to admit that it's a pretext. So what service, what, what would actually, um, what would be the role, what would be the purpose of asking for reasons if in fact, in any case, an employer can terminate with notice and severance? Mm -hmm. I just, I'm having but trouble, again, perhaps that, you can help me. This falls under the second of the two scenarios. If the employee views, again, that the dismissal was, out with, uh, was a pretext for some other particular reason, such as denying rights and benefits under legislation, the employer is going to have to substantiate those reasons before an adjudicator. You're saying now, an employer is going to admit that it was a pretext? No, I'm, what I'm saying is that, as is the case where, even within the unionized context, where an employee alleges that he or she has been subject to discipline and the employer denies it, the employee is going to have to put forward a prima facie case. Then the burden transfers to the employer to substantiate that it wasn't the case. The same thing happens in respect of a case of pretext. I thought the reasons had to be given before the employee has to lead its evidence uh, establishing that it was an unjust cause. My, uh, I, I guess it just doesn't fit together for me, unless, of course, the reasons are going to say that, well, it was a layoff or there was a discontinuance or there was some other legitimate uh, business purpose for it. That, to me, is makes sense in terms of, of how this section fits into the code. But, the, but I have your answer. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that and, and just perhaps even now cover off this issue of burden of proof. The burden of proof really is no different than what exists under the unionized context. For example, if an employee is dismissed for just cause, the employer bears the burden of establishing that just cause existed. Where an employee is dismissed without cause, and the sole issue is the- Without just cause. Without oh. just cause. Well, without cause. Without cause. Yeah. Without cause is that there is <laughs> there's a reason he dismissed him i mean unless the employer is totally irrational that so, is correct so i think a lot of the problem we're having here is terminology and we get caught up in the common law just and unjust and and uh, and then we just say cause simplicity or no cause of course when you say no cause what you're trying to say i think is no cause that would withstand scrutiny. Uh, but it's a very difficult. We have to be really careful with how we use it's a, the word. Yeah, well, I guess that the, the problem here with Bench is that certainly within those, uh, the practicing field, labor and employment, the term cause typically in captures the, a just cause concept. That's, uh, you've got an audience here that's not immersed in this yes, on a daily basis. So that. some of the questions you're getting, I think, are coming at you from that angle. Right. So just to, just to be careful about the words or whatever. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice. Can I ask so, a legis I, I'm sorry, am I taking you off course by asking you a legislative intent question? I, I just want to finish off okay, the, bur sure. the burden issue and then I invite your question, is that uh, when an employee is dismissed, what I call this, without cause, and uh, only contest the severance, 
then again, the employer bears the burden of proving the appropriateness of that package. In the third case, where an employee is dismissed, again, without cause, and alleges that it's a pretext, as would be case in a unionized context, the employee bears the initial burden of establishing a prima facie case, and then the burden transfers over to the employer to rebut. So the burden, as it is situated now, even in a without cause regime, is the same as it would be even within the unionized context. Okay. Um, I think rather than, from my perspective, rather than having examples of the kinds of reasons that could or couldn't be given, it's more helpful just to think about what the purpose was of Section 240 and 243. So I appreciate your response, because once we know what you say the change was that came about with Section 240, we can think about what kinds of reasons make sense or don't make exactly. sense. Exactly. So could you tell me what you say there, when Sections 230 and 235 were implemented in 1971, um, dealing with severance pay and termination for those who were under three months. What do you say the law of dismissal was for non-unionized employees? Was it the common law? Yes, because they had to resort to the common law to seek remedy. Section 240 brought in an administrative regime to address it internally. And again, I think it's important that you understand from a sequential point of view how 230 and 235 interrelates with... Be okay, before we get there, yeah. I just want to talk about legislative purpose. So, yes. until 1978, with the introduction of Section 240, it was the common law and employers could dismiss without... simply by providing... Did they have to do notice or severance pay? You didn't have to have just cause. No, we'll say, yeah, Section 230 and 235 Third, provide right. for notice right. and okay. pay. So Section 240 comes in. Does it, in your view, change anything about the common law right of an employer in dismissal? Section 168, the first part of Section 168, makes it very clear that the provisions of Part 3 of the Code apply notwithstanding any other law custom contract or arrangement. So to that extent, the adjudicator has to have regard to unjustness as it occurs under the code. If where the, and the latter part of section 168 confirms that where a benefit or entitlement is greater under any other law, that can be used by the adjudicator as it may be certainly persuasive in determining whether or not and how to fashion the remedy. What was there about Section 240 and that scheme that you say changed the common law of dismissal or termination? I, uh, it is our perspective that 240 simply provided an administrative scheme that uh, provides uh, a basis in which employees under Part 3 of the Code can pursue wrong, uh, pursue. Uh, dismissal complaints that is unparalleled in scope to that which is available to employees under any of the provincial uh, okay. jurisdictions. So let's look at the remedies that were provided. You have reinstatement, you have, according to the Roberts decision, the possibility of progressive discipline. Um, you have compensation that is equivalent to the remuneration, et cetera. I'm looking at uh, the sub four. So you have a whole range of remedies that are simply not available at common law. Is that right? Yes, certainly, yes, that's correct. So to what extent is the common law of any relevance then in interpreting what is meant by Section 240? And why would we resort to that in deciding what legislative intent was in Section 240 if not to provide what the minister said it was meant to provide, which is an analogous scheme to what exists in collective bargaining. The comments made by Minister Munro are, uh, l let me preface this. This court has stated on previous occasions that where a minister's statements made either in or out of the house 
are ambiguous and of themselves inconclusive or, into, or, or unclear is that they should be read with caution. And while Minister Monroe's comments are interesting in this case, there are nevertheless certain uncertainties or ambiguities that arise from his comments. Specifically, for example, he states, it was noted earlier, that uh, the Section 240 complaint regime was to, uh, was to prevent arbitrary dismissal. But on the other hand, he also said in the House of Commons that, quote, he was not alleging for one moment that he was matching the standards of collective agreements. On another occasion, which is somewhat ambiguous, is the fact that in a Labour Gazette article that was referenced by my friend, Mr. Monroe stated that the Section 240 regime was to be confined solely to deal with terminations for misconduct. But it is certainly indisputable that Section 240 deals with a range of various dismissal types. The bottom line is, and I can provide you a number of inconsistencies and ambiguities that arise from his statements. While they are interesting, they are not conclusive as to the meaning of the term unjust uh, as it's used in Section 240, and therefore they're not particularly helpful in this case. You've made reference to uh, 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 George Adams' decision in Bank of Montreal. Let me say that uh, Mr. Adams, for the record, is a very uh, has a, an esteemed reputation in the field of labor law. But having said that, the facts of the case giving rise to uh, the complaint before him was dealing with a, with a just cause dismissal. He did not resort to, nor did he have to resort to, an analysis of sections 230 and 235 and how they reconciled with section 240. So again, his comments are not particularly helpful because he did not have to decide the very question that's before you today. The fact that thousands of arbitrators before <clears throat> until 1994 saw the scheme the same way, where, where should we put that in our thinking about what the minister meant and how it was seen in the labor bar? There's been reference this morning about this vast body of jurisprudence in which, uh, as you have heard, states that you can only dismiss for just cause under Part 3 of the Code. That body of jurisprudence, without exception, as far as I'm aware, because the other parties haven't brought anything further to the attention of either the courts or myself, is that they fall within one or two categories. The first category is that they completely ignore the existence of sections 230 and 235. The second category is that they make brief reference to sections 230 and 235, but they make absolutely no attempt to reconcile those two sections with section 240. So it's not surprising that Mr. Justice Stratison's decision found that that body of jurisprudence was, quote, unsupported by authority and logic and lacking in an explanation. And in fact, uh, adjudicator Wakeling, as he then was, also found that that body of jurisprudence was wanting in analysis, as noted in his uh, decision, Shalhoub versus Just Paul First Nation. Yes, uh, you're going to address this, I assume, but there's an argument that the exceptions in Part 3 dovetail with the other provisions, and therefore the Act is a consistent whole. Justice Cromwell uh, <coughs> referred you to Professor Arthur's, or referred your colleague to Professor Arthur's. So uh, you, you'll have to, you, you keep saying there's a contradiction there, but you're going to have to address that, I think. And again, this all comes back to the operation of Sections 230 and 235 and how they interact with Section 240. In terms, just sorry to interrupt again, in terms of changes to the common law, correct me if I'm wrong, at common law, the employer can fire someone and the employee can't say, I want you to give me a reason. Is that right or wrong? That is correct. Okay, so that's one Unless case. they were terminated for just cause. <laughs> but, but if you're just terminating because you just want to get rid of the person, 
you don't have to give a reason. What you do have to do is give notice and, and or severance, Correct. right? So that's one change. The second change is, it seems to me, that if the, so, the, so now the employer says, here's my cause. If that falls short of just cause, that would, that would entitle the employer not to give notice or severance, a big difference, it, because if the employer falls short of showing just cause at common law, as I understand it, the only remedy is damages. We're not talking about reinstatement or anything else, but here, if the employer falls short of showing any just cause that would allow no notice or severance, there's an extra remedy that's available, a big one, the potential for reinstatement. So that's a second change from the common law, Correct. as I see it. Correct. Okay. But again, the reinstatement provision doesn't in and of itself denote that the term unjust means termination only for just, just cause. And perhaps let me address that, if I may. It, <clears throat> There's no dispute that within the unionized context, reinstatement is a presumptive remedy, but that's understood because in the unionized context, collector agreements specifically say that employees may only be dismissed for just cause. And so there is a concept of jobs, job security that exists. Okay, so it's understandable, presumptive remedy applies. However, the principle of job security does not exist in for non-unionized employees. And that's recognized but isn't that by the, the existence. Isn't that the question here, though? Isn't that the question that we're having to decide, whether the government intended to import that consideration into uh, the non-unionized sector by way of Part 3? I mean, that you're using the, the, the fact of it to, to, uh, well, to buttress your argument, but but... I mean, that seems to be the question that we have to decide. But and what I was going to finish off yeah. saying is that the, the concept of job security doesn't exist because of the existence of sections 230 and 235, which recognize a statutory right to dismiss without cause. So again, to echo the Chief Justice, what's, what's your response to the appellant's argument that really that has a narrower application than, than what you're suggesting? Because I think that, again, this all comes down to uh, the court that is focusing on the reasons that, again, are being given. And that is to say is that the reasons given are relevant in two scenarios, which I outlined earlier. But it is irrelevant otherwise because sex, that section has to be read in conjunction with and is, and is compatible with sections 230 and 235 which permit a dismissal on a without cause basis. But would that mean then that uh, you can always avoid the possibility of reinstatement by terminating without cause and giving proper severance? No, because as I stated earlier, for as an example, in a case where an employee is dismissed without cause and provided the appropriate notice and severance, if that employee views that dismissal to be, for example, a pretext. Let's leave alone the, let's leave alone the pretext. Somebody is terminated, he's being offered a reasonable severance, but that's not what he wants. He wants the job. Are you saying that he can't? That in the, in the standard, you know, without cause dismissal, there's no other issue. No, there is no permanent job security under part three of the code. The only issue is, what is the appropriate severance package? Well, it's not automatic job security, but it's potential that the employee can ask to be reinstated, which let, is different. And let me be clear here, is that in a dismissal without cause, all of the remedial powers of the adjudicator remain intact. So yes, technically speaking, he, could ex he or she could exercise the power to reinstate. There's no doubt. But I'm also looking at from the pragmatic point of view. And that is, is that in those kinds of cases, it's more often than not the adjudicator is simply going to determine whether the, the severance package was appropriate in the circumstances. Can you tell me why then the interpretation offered by your friends is unreasonable? 
because you, you're agreed that the st you agree that the standard of review is reasonableness. I yes. gather. So you're you're making a case for the reasonableness of what you're proposing. Why is their interpretation unreasonable? And this comes back again to my analysis of sections 230, 235, and how they're integrated with section 240, because this is crucial to the respondent's position. The the appellant and the interveners had stated that section 230 and 235 only apply in limited exceptional circumstances. It is not an unfettered right for the employer to exercise a dismissal without cause. They say that these limitations are what they identify as statutory exemptions are the occasions in which sections 230 and 235 can apply. That is only when the complaint system is not activated can employers dismiss on that basis, such as in the case of managers for layoff who cannot access the complaint regime, they say that those are the cases where you can dismiss without cause. My response to that essentially is twofold. First is, is that there's a complete absence of any words in the code that limit the exercise of sections 230 and 235. And if it had been Parliament's intention to do so, they would have expressly provided for it. Can I ask you a question about that? 235 is headed severance pay, mm -hmm. and only, I don't see it setting out any rights. It just sets out what the severance pay is. Section 230 is in a section called individual termination of employment and only deals, as far as I can tell, with employees under three months. So what, what rights to dismissal, not dismissal, other than um, a package of pay are we dealing with in section 230 and 235? I'm not certain I Well, you said there's the nothing question. to indicate what it's about, but sections 230 and 235 seem to be from mm -hmm. the legislative headings, minimal rate, minimum rate, severance pay. It's talking about what happens when there's a dismissal, not what kinds of dismissals are permitted or not. That is correct. Okay. So that means we look to 240 to determine what the rights about dismissal are, not to 230 or 235, because I thought you were interpreting them as rights uh, creating provisions. What I'm saying is that sections 230 and 235 provide meaning to the term unjust in section 240. We get that from which words? Well, if, if, if I may, Madam Justice, I would like to provide my analysis on that. But I just want to talk about very quickly about these exemptions that were raised. And as I said, I already provided my first response that there is no limitation to the exercise of 230 and 235. The second point is that some of these statutory exemptions that were identified by the appellant and the interveners would lead to an absurd exercise of sections 230 and 235. Specifically, the Canadian Labour Congress argues at paragraph 18 of its factum that an employer may dismiss without cause, provided the employee doesn't subsequently file a complaint. The uh, intervener non-organized employees at paragraph 14 of its fact, and as you heard this morning, indicated that an employer can dismiss without cause, provided the minister doesn't refer the complaint to an adjudicator. So according to their logic, the statutory right to dismiss without cause is wholly predicated on whether future events happen. And that, with respect, means that a scheme is uncertain, unpredictable in its application. But that's an employer has a right to dismiss without cause regardless of whether an employee subsequently files a complaint or whether the minister... Well, they may, but then they might be subject to giving reasons, which you concede, and they might be subject to an arbitrator saying reinstate. So, you know, we don't have to stuff it within a common law box. We can just say, what does this statute say on its face? It says, employee wants to let them go, her go, give reasons. And you've already conceded they should be substantive and real reasons for e e expressing what the situation was. Then we move on to step two, which is what can the arbitrator do? And the arbitrator can do a whole lot of things. And, uh, and one of the things he can do is uh, order reinstatement, which follows the job security line. 